welcome to the Sports Playbook, where we discuss solutions to issues that impact sports. I'm your host, Angela Hazlett. Today's guest is Brian Fox, Corporate Counsel Attorney and Board Chair of the NIL Collective, Cincy Reigns. Today, we're going to discuss name, image, and likeness collectives, NIL challenges, and opportunities. Let's get to it. Welcome, Brian. Thank you for joining us today on the Sports Playbook. Thank you for having me. Uh, lovely to connect again uh, with an old classmate. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We've known each other for several years now, and you have uh, done a lot of things in, in sports and, and most recently working with an NIL collective. And I'll give uh, our audience a little bit of a background so they understand the context of how NIL collectives came to be. Um, starting in 2021, the NCAA versus Austin case, the Supreme Court ruled that NCAA restrictions on educated related benefits for college athletes restrained trade or commerce in violation of antitrust law. And following that decision, the NCAA decided to allow student athletes to receive compensation in exchange for their name, image, and likeness, which is commonly referred to as NIL. With this change, college athletes can now profit off their right to publicity. So Brian, with your background and experience, how are athletes able to capitalize off of their name, image, and likeness? Yeah, so they can um, work with uh, brands and companies to engage in marketing, advertising, promotional activities. That's what folks uh, have always been able to do, but there have been, you know, pretty profound restrictions imposed by the NCAA over the years until uh, 2021, which uh, completely changed the uh, environment in collegiate athletics. Absolutely. And there's been many collectives popping up since then. So describe to me what exactly is an NIL collective and how do they work with student athletes in this capacity? Yeah, so um, NIL collectives uh, crowdsource fundraising from the fan base, alumni, and and, uh, customary donor communities. Um, We then uh, work with student athletes um, and and coaches and other intermediaries to determine um, what sorts of opportunities student athletes are interested in. And then um, we try to partner with um, other charitable and philanthropic entities and uh, organizations throughout the greater Cincinnati area. And so we try to tee up opportunities for them to go serve, which is great, gives back. We also try to tee up opportunities for them to use their platforms, which are uh, unique and big often because of, you know, if somebody ends up playing division one sport at the University of Cincinnati, they were probably the best in their hometown. And so there were a lot of eyeballs and a lot of attention and and so then they land in our, you know, uh, environment, the University of Cincinnati, and they can connect um, people that root for them to some of these organizations as well. So you're doing a lot of, of development, fundraising type of activities, ways to kind of funnel compensation to athletes. And then in turn, their name, image, and likeness is used to help promote these local philanthropic causes. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's 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 also um, so since he reigns is structured like most um, of the larger collectives are structured at the Power Five institutions. I mean, the Power Five conference um, members were the first to hop on this model, and so that we have a nonprofit uh, entity as well as an LLC. And so with our LLC, we try to source deals. We serve as a clearinghouse um, for local brands, uh, regional brands, national brands to connect with our student athletes. And we try to you know, collaborate with student athletes to curate among their interests and predilections, what sorts of businesses and companies they might work well with. Uh, and then we um, you know, help them structure the deal and, and get the athlete an op- opportunity to, to, to get some return, additional return on their investment of time. It sounds like a little bit twofold, a little bit of commercial activity and a little bit of philanthropic type of activity. And I'm sure you've probably heard some concerns from 
universities or maybe even coaches, what kind of concerns might be they might be expressed about student athletes taking advantage of NIL opportunities or maybe being taken advantage of through this process? Um, you hear a lot of concerns expressed, and so I think it takes a while for the world to adjust to any new change. And, um, you know, if you've been a, a coach, uh, football, basketball, whatever, you know, sport, uh, tennis coach, you have in your mind what that looks like at the collegiate level. Um, the NCAA has prioritized amateurism from their perspective. And, and so it has looked a certain way for decades and decades and decades. And now all of a sudden the Supreme Court um, changes the state of play effectively for everyone. And so I think it's hard to adjust to that. So you have, um, you know, you have the question of parity. I hear that a lot. You know, will smaller schools that may have traditionally had a better opportunity to compete with the bigger institutions now have no chance because uh, the amount of resources that uh, the University of Texas can uh, put together to support their NIL ecosystem is obviously going to scale different than the resources available, you know, to uh, James Madison University, for instance. And so um, that concern is always expressed. There's a, there's uh, also this there's a traditional leverage um, play that's that's been ongoing, which is. Um, in the past, you had, uh, while they introduced the transfer portal, um, you know, there, there are now student athletes who have transferred to a number of different institutions. There's a, the quarterback for Rice, for instance, um, is now playing at his fourth institution. So there's a concern that um, it's like a revolving free agency every year with no limitation. Um, and there are no limitations. There's no limitations on um, the amount of uh money that a student athlete can make off of their name, image, and likeness. And, and so that I think is of concern to some, but I also, I think a lot of those concerns are uh, misguided, alarmist, um, because the marketplace does what the marketplace does, which is over time, I think things will settle and, and will right size. Now, a number of things that are on the horizon that could throw a wrench in the wheel of the marketplace being able to uh, to settle things like that you know the house decision is is out there it's a um, class action case that right now being brought uh, by an Arizona state former Arizona state athlete and the, and a number of other athletes um, relative to the Nil rules imposed by the NCAA um, which has been reached class certification in which um, a lot of folks in the industry, think that the NCAA um, stands a great chance of losing. That could change things. The Department of Labor is reviewing whether, um, you know, whether student athletes are uh, employees of universities and should be treated as employees of universities. And so the Department of Labor makes that determination. That changes things dramatically. Um, and then you've got some legislative efforts. The NCAA has uh, a whole host of lobbyists that are um, working with members of Congress to try to obtain an antitrust exemption for the NCAA like the NFL has and like Major League Baseball has. Um, and, you know, it, so the reason I think a lot of people in the industry think that um, the NCAA is vulnerable in the House case is because, uh, you know, if if the NCAA is seeking an antitrust exemption, doesn't that function as some sort of a tacit admission that they're engaged in antitrust? <laughs> and that's that's not even that's not even to mention what the Supreme Court said in the Alston decision, um, which yes. really was all about antitrust. And while they didn't make that fundamental determination, Brett Kavanaugh and his concurrence, or Justice Kavanaugh, I should say, it's not like he's a, a, a neighbor. Um, <laughs> Justice Kavanaugh and his concurrence said um, that, boy, it sure sounds a whole like the NCAA is engaged in antitrust. While well, it's not necessarily something we're going to touch upon because that's not, you know, an issue for our review. It's that, that that seems to be a signal in the direction that the legal environment is going. Yes. And, and to your point, Justice Kavanaugh's language um, in his concurring opinion states that nowhere else in America can businesses get away with agreeing not to pay their workers a fair market rate 
on the theory that their product is defined by not paying their workers a fair market rate. Um, the NCAA is not above the law. So just emphasizing that point on that these these athletes are not earning a fair market wage and there's concern for that and how they should be recognized employment. Well, you had so many nuggets there, Brian, so many avenues that we could go down and you talked about the different landscape and ways that 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 NIL might be shaped through different agencies, through different governing bodies. Let's focus in a little bit on some state law and particularly Ohio, because since he reigns operates in Ohio and, and you're trying to serve the University of Cincinnati students through your collective. So talk to me a little bit about Ohio and, and how does that shape what you're able to do for student athletes in Cincinnati? Yeah, so Ohio um, responded preliminarily. So once the Alston decision uh, was issued, the NCAA um, moved to create the interim guidance on name, image, and likeness. And states across the country started responding. Ohio was one of those states, obviously, that responded. The first mover was um, Governor DeWine. He um, issued an executive order that was signed into law. And the executive order that he signed into law was basically a placeholder um, that until such time as the General Assembly uh, develops, you know, a program and rules for, um, you know, uh, uh, our public in institutions or our not even our public, public and private, uh, higher education institutions, um, then that that will be effective. And so then the General Assembly effectively mirrored what um, the executive order uh, was like the kind of the architecture, the statutory architecture, which um, it says that the universities cannot limit, they can't throttle how much a student athlete can make off of their name, image and likeness. And um, it said that, you know, uh, this legislation says that if the university develops rules around a certain category of products, right, if, for instance, uh, an institution say you, um, our student athletes are not uh, permitted to advertise or promote alcohol or uh, tobacco or uh, gambling, you know, various categories that are uh, uh, commonly uh, no-nos in amateur athletics, then they, they said that, that universities um, are able to regulate in that way. Um, and then, you know, so Ohio is a little bit different from other states. Some other states really got active and tried to create as an aggressive and supportive um, name, image, and likeness environment as possible. Um, the state of Missouri, for instance, has been one of the uh, most aggressive about supporting their um, their student athletes uh, at their schools. Texas has also uh, been very active, not surprisingly, California as well. Brian, let's talk a little bit about some of these restrictions that universities can set on categories that uh, athletes can endorse. So let's let's look at the example Livy Dunn. She's a top female NIL earner, college student athlete. She's recently promoted an artificial intelligence tool that is used to help with homework on social media. And so immediately following this, her university, Louisiana State University, put out a statement that expressed concern over students using AI to help them with their schoolwork. So just because athletes now have a recognized right to publicity doesn't mean uh, they're able to promote any type of business. So who actually decides which types of NIL deals are allowed? Um, what happens if an NIL deal is made that doesn't reflect positively on their school? You mentioned a little bit, could be in the legislature, could be in the university. Um, but what do you think? I mean, AI is it's kind of a new tool. And, and as technology and other things evolve, how is this difficult? Think about it from the collective standpoint, the NIL collective, you're trying to broker these deals for athletes or bring in um, entities and these connections, these relationships and contracts. And, and talk to me a little bit about those concerns with that changing regulation landscape. Yeah. So, um, you know, if, uh, if the universe, if, if Louisiana State University wanted um, to prohibit that category, then they uh, they likely should have prohibited that category um, by passing a university rule that requires that. Um, they didn't, and I, I don't. The state of Louisiana does not obviously have a statute prohibiting that. 
So I can't retroactively um, go back and, right, and, and do right. about that. Now, you know, as a as the board chair for Cincy Reigns, we have been approached by businesses that uh, exist within categories that might be uh, on the edge, right? And that might reflect poorly if um, a group of student athletes were selling their products. And so I just as um, trying to remain in alignment with the university, um, not every collective is the same. And, and a lot of um, schools have a, you know numerous collectives that are involved, um, some in much more alignment with the university's uh, desires and best interests than others. What I've tried to do and what our board has tried to do with Cincy Reigns is to remain in alignment with the athletic department. We've tried to remain in alignment with the university. And we don't want to do anything that's going to adversely reflect upon the University of Cincinnati. And, and we want, if somebody's out, um, you know, in our community uh, and they're wearing bear cats across their chest, we, we want it to be um, something that everybody can, can buy in on and feel proud of. And so for us, we've kind of um, passed on some of those uh, more borderline categories. But, um, but you know, that's a decision that every NIL program has to make. That's a decision that uh, the stakeholders in each university's ecosystem have to, to weigh in on. Are there any collectives that are supporting more than one university or conferences, or are they all focused at supporting one institution? Um, that's a good question. And I would say there's not a lot of data out there on what collectives are doing and how they're doing it, because that's the, um, they're not public entities. So we're not bound and we're autonomous from the universities themselves. We're, that's a requirement under Ohio law and, and most state laws. So we're not, so we're, we're autonomous and, um, and so we're not public entities, we're private entities. So um, that's been an interesting thing in, you know, in trying to structure and, and be excellent in how we operate. Um, our collective is trying to figure out what our best practice is. Mm -hmm. And it's tough to really source some of that information because so much of it is buried. Right. And um, I, I do think that there are um, collectives. There, there may not be folks that are advertising themselves as collectives, but I do think that there are collectives uh, and NIL programs that are uh, working with multiple institutions mm. on there. In fact, I'm, I'm certain of it, but they're not, um, it's not a, a, a public information sort of thing that's available. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You, you mentioned something previously about parity, and you were talking about different athletic programs and the size and impact that they may have, the reach that they may have, and how that's impacted um, transfers and, and recruiting and things like that. Um, I'm curious about athletes from the, the more non-revenue generating sports and I know you've expressed that it's really important to kind of represent athletes from, from all the sports and, and have not only gender equity, but those non-revenue generating sports. Talk to me a little bit about the philosophy that you have as a collective to support athletes from different programs. We, we, we want to engage um, every varsity sport at the University of Cincinnati. We want to be about all of you know, if you're if if you're a mom and dad and or mom or dad and you send your young uh, son or daughter to the University of Cincinnati, um, if it's possible. Now it, we're early in you know we're kind of in the infancy stages of NIL, but um, if you entrust your child to the University of Cincinnati, and if you're a young uh, athlete and you come here, we we want to try to figure out a way to be a part of your life and to make a uh, meaningful contribution to your life. So we've tried to um, to be mindful of that and to be mindful of the risk of only um, focus, you know, only working with the main revenue sports. So we, we do try to um, get involved with the uh, you know, every sport. We've, uh, since he reigns, we've signed uh, a student athlete from every program. And we hope to only expand, you know, the, the number of uh, young men and women that are uh, competing that that are that we partner with. So donors and and corporate entities that you're you're doing business with, do they support that philosophy as well, or do you find that a tough sell that that your portfolio may include 
students who student athletes who uh, maybe don't fit what the the brands are looking for um uh, everybody is different so each uh each donor is different and um and there's also of course the 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 fan base which can run in any number of directions um if if so we have a pathway if you're going to contribute to cincy reigns you go to our website you can earmark your donation to a certain sport and we've seen plenty of that which is great you know if if you are um you know if you play tennis at the university of cincinnati um it, there's a good chance may, you know maybe you love bearcats football maybe you love bearcats basketball but if you have that you know the personal buy-in and that connection to that program of course you're going to um, want to support what you experience. And you're going to look at those student athletes and see yourself in them and want to um, improve their lives. So we, we try to provide that pathway. And then and we also try to be active about, um, even if we don't have stakeholders that are directly tied in and, and trying to, you know, zoom out and survey and go, how can we, how can we be um, how can we be involved in helping that program and help, helping those young men and women? Because, um, I, I, you know, the reason that I got involved um, was because we we want to help young men and women. We want to help our charitable and philanthropic partners throughout greater Cincinnati. And I believe that if the University of Cincinnati's student athletes are thriving, that means that, um, you know, the athletics are often the front porch of a university. And if folks are out there doing good in our community and making a difference and their lives are improving and they're out serving in when wearing bear cuts across our chest, that's great for the University of Cincinnati. And what's great for the University of Cincinnati is great for the city of Cincinnati and our region. So, um, you know, there's there's a, uh, a desire to really you know, make a difference. That's great. Tell me about some of the interesting partnerships you've been able to create or maybe something that you're most proud of during your time involved with Cincy Reigns Collective? Um, in what context? Are you thinking so about? you have, you, for you example, like you were able partner? to create a par partnership with a brewery and, and do yes. you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So we, we um, early on in the process wanted to um, partner with uh, a beer to create, um, you know, a, a Cincy Reigns um, using our name, image, image and likeness um, to partner with someone, one of the local breweries to uh, create a product that would benefit our fan base and also benefit our NIL ecosystem. So we met with a number of different breweries in Cincinnati and uh, sat down with the Rheingeis team. Rheingeis is, um, I think it's maybe the 20th uh, biggest brewery in the country. Um, so they had good size and scale and we met with their team and there was, you know, good alignment about what the vision was for this. And, um, and so we created a uh, Cincy light, which, um, when we initially sat down and, and launched the product, we had, we had really no idea what kind of reception we, we had some hunches that people will think it's fun and cool. And it's great to feel like, you know, you're tailgating on the grid. We have this grid right by <laughs> Nippert Stadium that you can um, uh, you know, drink Cincy Rain, Cincy Light, uh, Rhine Geist beer and 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 know that you're you know supporting things there. Um, so that that has been it, it's far exceeded our expectations. Um, and it's you know a Rhine Geist has had to hire seven additional employees. They've had to figure out a way to manage the scale. People are constantly tweeting hey i found you know cincy light you know that my kroger has um cincy light you know and then take a picture of it so it's been a lot of fun are they selling it in nippard stadium at, at university of cincinnati they are they are and they're going to sell it inside fifth third arena as well yeah fantastic that's that's incredible Let's talk a little bit about the the future landscape of NIL and the NIL collectives. You mentioned some some concerns or potential changes, but I'd like to hear a little bit about your predictions based on your knowledge and experience. What do you think the future landscape is going to look like for NIL? It, yeah, I will say that that question is maybe the toughest question that confronts me, my board. Um, at, you know, the athletic department, um, student athletes, coaches every day, how long will what's in place remain in place? 
Um, you know, if you just look at the progression from um, the summer of 2021 until now, the NCAA has issued guidance and updated guidance and updated guidance and additional updated guidance. And so there have been so many changes just from the NCAA's regulatory position toward NIL. Um, and then, you know, you look at what's going on with Congress and is Congress going to, you know, put something together? It's been my experience that Congress hasn't been exceedingly effective in recent years. So I have my doubts that Congress will uh, put together a solution that it makes enough people happy that there's, you know, universal buy-in. Um, I think it's probably the, the battleground is going to take place in the courts. And um, I think a lot of it's going to depend upon the you know, litigation posture that the NCAA takes. They have historically taken a very aggressive litigation stance, and it has cost them again and again and again. Um, you know, with this House case, they are uh, they're really um, backed into a corner. And it, it's not that's not the end of it. Right. I mean, the, the House case is one case. There have been so many other like the NCAA just recently changed their um, their waiver uh, for transfer rules. Right. So there, there's the one time transfer, but then they've really cracked down on student athletes who are trying to transfer multiple times. So um, they've just changed that last year or I'm sorry, late or early this year. And so um, if you read that Alston decision uh, against the backdrop of or with that in the backdrop of the NCAA's pivot on the waiver rule, you're seeing a lot of folks who are uh, having a real hard time with it. Like you take the University of North Carolina and Tez Walker's waiver exemption, where um, the North Carolina Attorney General um, sent a letter to uh, the NCAA president Charlie Baker to say, "Hey, um, you know this isn't this is not only a, a problem and it's unfair, but." Uh, it's also probably illegal. And so yeah, there's, I think the battleground is probably going to take place either in the Department of Labor making a determination that student athletes are employees or it's going to take place uh, in the courts with this House case or any of the, you know, uh, umpteen cases that are about to be filed probably. Ouch. And, and what happens to the NCAA institution and its member institutions um, if that happens? I don't know. And I don't think the NCAA <laughs> knows. And I think that's, it's been interesting to me. Um, so the NCAA has not been, other than this waiver, um, you know, the transfer waiver exemption uh, change, they have not been aggressive in enforcing NIL. There's, there's been, um, you know, you, you're not hearing about any cases or any infractions, actions that are being taken by them. So the NCAA seems to understand that it may not have great legs to stand on um, with regard to limiting NIL. And so it's been interesting that they, they've taken such a hardline position on the, the transfer rule on a number of cases. Um, I think the NCAA knows that it's in a battle for their uh, ongoing viability. Um, if, if, you know, when you get a hit with an you know a Sherman Act violation, and you know there is a, a finding that you uh, engaged in antitrust and you um, throttled student athletes' right to compensation uh, off of their name, image, and likeness. Um, it, it's it's both going to be a heavy financial burden for the NCAA to bear, but it's also going to be, you know, a as a practical matter, um, a an operational uh, issue for them because. Um, what can the NCAA do if they're not engaged in really one of the primary functions for which they were formed, which was to try to provide a regulatory, yeah. Governance, um, but, you know, they'll yeah. still have the March Madness uh, tournament in <laughs> in the spring, and, and that may be all yeah. they're left with, potentially. Well, Brian, well, thank, you, yeah. thank you so much for your time. Do, do you have a final thought you wanted to include? I do not, um, but I, I thank you for having me on. It's lovely to see you out there uh, thriving in this world and, and professing at James Madison. That's so cool. And um, uh, go Bearcats, and uh, that's it. And go Dukes. So and, thanks yeah. for your time, Brian. Great to see you again and appreciate all your wisdom and insight into name, image, and likeness collective. So thank you for your time today.
Oh, thank you, Angela. Thank you to all our viewers on the Sports Playbook. We will see you next time with our episode uh, with Lila Drafts-Johnson, who will discuss gender-based violence. We'll see you then.